Welcome to a new series which I've entitled Prodigal Israel. Now I've given it that title because in Luke 15 where Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, I do believe that that story is primarily about Israel. Although there are many facets to that story and it can be applied in so many different ways, primarily I think that Jesus is really talking about Israel, who took the inheritance that God has given to them as the nation that was blessed of God, and they have squandered their inheritance by going after other gods, going into other nations. And it's only when Israel finds themselves in the pigsty that they will return to God their Father. And in returning, as Jesus explained in that story, they will be welcomed back. Now, Israel plays such a vital role in the history of the world, but in the Bible itself. Two-thirds of the Bible is dedicated to the nation of Israel and to God's dealings with them. And a lot of the New Testament is based upon the experience that Israel had. And so in understanding Israel, we will better understand the scriptures, even in the New Testament. So I'm wanting to look at the nation of Israel not as people that are saved, but ungodly, they've turned away from the Lord, ethnic Israel, where they are and what part they play in the history of the world. In this series, I'm looking to the Lord to demonstrate the faithfulness of God in his dealings with Israel, faithful to his promises, faithful to the covenant that he made with Abraham. So even though Israel has disobeyed God and wandered away, God has remained faithful, and that is a testimony to the character of God. But also as we look at um, fulfillment of prophecy in our very day, predictions that were made thousands of years ago, now being fulfilled in our very day, down to the finest detail, uh, it just reinforces the trustworthiness of Scripture, the reliability, and reinforces our confidence in the Word of God. And then, as I've already said, to understand the importance of Israel in the saga of human history. God is using Israel as a testimony to the other nations and we mustn't miss the message that he's presenting through Israel. And so that's why I believe it's important to emphasize this and put the spotlight on Israel to understand all of these things because this shapes our grasp of the whole of the word of God as I've already said and also shapes our understanding of God's dealings with the nations of the world and how he is bringing them all to a point where Jesus will return and set up his kingdom. Now before going any further, a lot of the facts that I'm going to be presenting in this series I've gleaned from a very interesting book that I read recently called The Oracle by Jonathan Kahn. Jonathan Kahn is a Jewish rabbi, but one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Jewish Messiah, so he is a Christian, and he has brought together a lot of historical facts and tied them with the predictions in Scripture, making a very compelling case for the importance of the nation of Israel. Now, having read that, I have gone and researched those facts for myself independently, and they're in the public domain, so it's easy for, the, for us to check the accuracy of these facts. And what I'll do is put my particular slant and the way these things have impacted me to provide a basis and a foundation for these points that I've raised to demonstrate the faithfulness of God, the reliability of Scripture and the importance of Israel in the saga of human history. Now, I once heard a man by the name of John Lennox, whom you may know. Um, he's a professor of mathematics in Cambridge University, but also a wonderful believer, and he is excellent at debating atheists and so on, and very powerfully supports the reliability of Scripture. I heard him once say that you can see much further if you're prepared to stand on the shoulders of those that are greater than yourself. And he was referring to C.S. Lewis, from whom he had learnt many things and he actually knew him personally. Now I'm doing a similar thing. I'm standing on those that have done a lot of research greater than me, pulling these facts together to present a case which I trust the Lord will use to sharpen our understanding and our appreciation for the nation of Israel and God's amazing wisdom and faithfulness. 
So let's start by looking at the magnificent promises that God made to the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 19. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now remember with Adam and Eve, God intended them to rule over the creation. They failed and now God is singling out this nation Israel and saying the same thing to them. They would be a kingdom of priests. In other words, they would rule with God by his authority and they would also be a kingdom of priests. Priests are advocates or go-between. So they would go between the nations of the world and God. They'd be God's representatives to the people and the people's representative to God. So God had this very high ideal and he's making these wonderful, wonderful promises to Israel, which unfortunately, as we know, they were not able to keep and they failed rather dismally. Then as we turn to Deuteronomy, we find Moses giving the final instructions before Israel go into the promised land and he was going to go up the mountain and die as God had told him. He says to Israel, if you do not carefully follow all the words of this law which are written in this book and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will scatter you among all nations from one end of the earth to the other. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known. Among those nations you will find no repose, no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing, and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread both night and day, never sure of your life. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening, and in the evening, if only it were morning. That's the state of depression. Because of the terror that will fill your hearts and the sights that your eyes will see. So the whole of the Old Testament then documents how Israel disobeyed God, found themselves eventually in captivity. Um, they were released from captivity in Babylon, came back, rebuilt the city, rebuilt the temple. And then in the time of Jesus, we find that the Lord Jesus makes a prediction about the temple and about Jerusalem. So here is a picture of the temple. It's the second temple, not the one that Solomon built. It's the one that was rebuilt. And we find this in Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings because in the Jewish thinking this temple was extremely important. It was the house of God. It was where God's presence was. So they knew it was very important. I think they were hoping for the Lord to say, well done, yes, it's a wonderful building. It's holy. It's the house of God, sacred, etc. But instead, this is what Jesus says as he makes his prediction. He says, do you see all these things? The temple, he asked. Truly, I tell you, not one stone there will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now we know that only a number of years, about 40 years later, this happened in AD 70. So let's pick up the story there from AD 70. So as history teaches us, in AD 70, the Roman Emperor Titus ransacked Jerusalem and the Jews were dispersed into all the surrounding nations just as Moses had prophesied in Deuteronomy 28. Their homeland was taken over by the Romans. They were driven out into the various nations. There was a triumphant arch built in Rome called the Arch of Titus, which I've had the good fortune of seeing and taking pictures of it. And you can see the depicting the Roman legion carrying articles from the temple in Jerusalem. So a tremendous confirmation that this is accurate, 
They ransacked Jerusalem, just as Jesus had said. They broke down the temple. They took everything. They took the gold of the temple and they returned to Rome, having absolutely decimated the nation of Israel and their land and their temple and Jerusalem. The last defiant Jews held their own against the Roman garrison on Masada, seen in the picture there. They went up to the top of the mountain and there they... Uh, had a fortress and they stood against the Romans for quite a long period of time until finally the Romans built their gigantic ramp which still can be seen in the picture there. The Jews took their own lives rather than being captured by the Romans as the Roman garrison came up that ramp they took their own lives and so that was the the end the, the final stand of the battle and that was the end of the nation of Israel, Jews having now been dispersed into all the various nations around about. Let's just go back for a moment and look at what Moses had to say about the year of Jubilee, because this is a very important point. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you is to return to your family property and to your own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow and do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines. For it is a jubilee and it is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. In this year of jubilee, everyone is to return to their own property. Now that's obviously very important because Israel having lost their homeland... We know that God has given it back to them, even in our day. They're back in their homeland. And this is really a fulfillment of the whole principle of the Jubilee. But it has a greater fulfillment in that God also wants his land back. Because the whole world belongs to him, as he said to Moses, as we read. And God wants this his world back. The devil has taken possession of it. He's spoken of as the God of this world or as the prince of this world, and God is wanting to restore the world, take position, and actually come and live amongst us. So Jubilee has tremendous implications to it, and is a very important timepiece in understanding the fulfillment of various prophecies. So let's see how this plays out as we go on a little further. So moving on from AD 70, we know that the Romans occupied the land, they paganized everything. They changed the name of the, the Holy Land to Palestine. They had murdered many of the Jews. They'd driven the rest out into the various nations around about, as we know. And they occupied the land until eventually the empire was divided and the Byzantines took over. And they occupied the land for quite a period of time until in the time of Muhammad the Muslims moved in they conquered the Byzantines and they then occupied the land and there were just a few occasions where the crusaders sent by the popes came in and conquered and they occupied the land but just for a short period of time and the Muslims once again drove them out until this particular event which is very significant the Ottoman Empire which is the Turkish people they came and took possession of the Holy Land after the Battle of Redania, which took place in 1517. That was in Egypt. They conquered the Malkins in Egypt. And because of that victory, he was able to take over all the lands that were under the Malkins, and that included the Holy Land or Palestine, as they called it then. So now the Ottoman Empire occupied the land until fairly recent times the Turks were in charge of the Holy Land and the Jews were driven out. There were no Jews in that land at all. The year of 1517 when the Ottoman Empire took over the Holy Land is particularly important and this is where the Jubilee years come into play and we start to see the great significance of all of this as it begins to come together. So seven jubilees from the time of the Ottoman Empire occupied the land brings us to 1867. And if you need a maths lesson, here it is. Seven times 50 years, jubilees, equals 350 years. Add that to 1517 and you get 1867. So this is a very significant jubilee year, 1867. 
So going back to what Moses has to say, so let's look at the prediction in Deuteronomy 29. Moses said, Your children who follow you in later generations and foreigners who come from distant lands will see the calamities that have fallen on the land and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it. The whole land will be a burning waste and salt and sulfur, nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in fierce anger. And let's just note that that word foreigners in this passage in the original is nakri, which is singular, which means that the passage would read, and a foreigner will come from a distant land and see the calamities that have fallen on the land, etc., etc. Then Moses goes on and he says, All the nations will say, Why has the Lord done this to this land? What caused the heat of his great anger? Then people will say, It is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, and went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they had not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury, and great wrath, and cast them into another land as they are this day. And that happened, as we said, in AD 70, and the Lord used the Romans to do this very thing. So let's just go on, because the scripture now, we've ended there in Deuteronomy 29, verse 28, but the scripture follows on as Moses carries on, and he tells them, but in the end time, there is hope. So Moses says to the people of Israel, and if you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. That's how merciful and patient God is. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you. And from there he will take you, and the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. What a wonderful promise. And that, that talks back to the prodigal son story, <clears throat> where the father welcomes his son back with great joy and jubilation and with blessing. So here is the promise that God is making through Moses to the nation of Israel. Let's now consider the significance of the year 1867, which I've already said was a jubilee year, where this man, Mark Twain, a fairly well-known um, historical figure, he was a journalist for various newspapers, but also wrote the books Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. For some random reason, or apparently random reason, he decided to catch a ship called the Quaker City, travel to Europe, and then down to the Holy Land, and that was in 1867. Now this doesn't seem important and really hasn't made headlines in history until we start to look at the facts very carefully, and I'm really indebted to Jonathan Kahn for digging these things out. He compiled his findings in a book called The Innocents Abroad. So having reported on what he saw in the Holy Land and sent all these reports back to the various newspapers, he was then approached to write this book and put all his findings in this book, which spread the word throughout the world and outsold all his other books. So he actually became very well known because of this book and because of the information that he broadcasted to all the other nations about the desolation of Jerusalem, just as Moses had said, a foreigner would come from a far country and he would examine the land and he would be totally appalled at the condition of the land and then report it to all the other nations. And that's exactly what he did. This is just a picture of the book that he wrote, The Innocents Abroad. Now, Mark Twain 
was regarded as the father of American literature and he was a real craftsman when it came to describing things. So he was the ideal candidate that the Lord had chosen to look at this land and then report it to all the nations. Here are some of the things that he said. He said, of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. The hills are barren, they are dull of colour, they are unpicturesque in shape. The valleys are unsightly, deserts fringed with the feeble vegetation that has an expression about it of being sorrowful and despondent. The Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee sleep in the midst of a vast stretch of hill and plain wherein the eye rests upon no pleasant tint, no soft picture dreaming in a purple haze or mottled with the shadows of the clouds. Every outline is harsh, every feature is distinct, there is no perspective, distance works no enchantment here, it is a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Where Sodom and Gomorrah reared their domes and towers, the solemn sea now floods the plain, in whose bitter waters no living thing exists, over whose waveless surface the blistering air hangs motionless and dead, about whose borders nothing grows but weeds and scattering tufts of cane, and that treacherous fruit that promises refreshment to parching lips, but turns to ashes at the touch. Jericho the accursed lies a smouldering ruin today, even as Joshua's miracle left it more than 3,000 years ago. Bethlehem and Bethany, in the poverty and their humiliation, have nothing about them now to remind one that they once knew the high honour of the Saviour's presence. The hallowed post where the shepherds watched their flock by night and where the angels sang peace on earth, good will to men, is unattended by any living creature and unblessed by any feature that is pleasant to the eye. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur and has become a pauper village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the admiration of visiting oriental queens. The wonderful temple which was once the pride and glory of Israel is gone. The Ottoman crescent is lifted up. On the most memorable day in the annals of the world, they reared the Holy Cross, obviously, of the Lord Jesus. The noted Sea of Galilee, where Roman fleets once rode at anchor and the disciples of the Saviour sailed in their ships, was long ago deserted by the devotees of war and commerce. And its borders are a silent wilderness. Capernaum is a shapeless ruin. Uh, Magdala is the home of beggared Arabs. Bethesda and Chorazin have vanished from the earth, and the desert places around about them where thousands of men once listened to the Saviour's voice and ate the miraculous bread, sleep in the hush of a solitude that is inhabited only by birds of prey and skulking foxes. Palestine, he finally says, is desolate and unlovely, and why should it be otherwise? Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Mark Twain's visit to the Holy Land becomes even more interesting when we recognize that he traveled around in 1867, uh, making his observations and writing his particular reports. But then he spent the last day of his visit in Jerusalem on the 28th of September before leaving to catch his boat and go back to America. Now what is significant about the 28th of September is that it was a Sabbath day. And on Sabbath days throughout the world in synagogues and throughout the calendar year, there are various scriptures that are read and they are called the Parshat. Now in this, on this particular Sabbath day, it was the Nitzavim that was read. Now the Nitzavim, I'll show you in a minute what that means. It's the scripture reading in the synagogues around the world. And this is reading the scroll. 
This is what they actually read on this particular day when Mark Twain was there in Jerusalem. Foreigners who come from distant lands will see the calamities that have fallen on the land and the diseases with which the Lord has afflicted it. The whole land will be a burning waste of salt and sulfur, nothing planted, nothing sprouting, no vegetation growing on it. It will be like the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in fierce anger. So the very scripture that was predicting the coming of a foreigner from a distant land to make his report and his assessment and to see the desolation of the land was being read on that very same day that Mark Twain was in Jerusalem, the day before he left. So the significance then, as we've said, of 1867 being the Jubilee year, it was a sign that God was describing this land and was bringing to an end the desolation. So this was now the beginning of God's working to return the land back to its original owners, to the nation of Israel. So it was the principle of the restoration during the Jubilee year that was starting to manifest itself right back here with Mark Twain's visit. So before leaving Mark Twain, let's note that there have always been devout Jews that have daily prayed that the Lord would hear their cry and that he would show them mercy and restore their land completely to them. And what they didn't realize is that Mark Twain was not his real name. His real name was actually Samuel Clemens. Now Samuel in Hebrew means God hears and Clemens is a Latin word which means merciful. So even though Israel was not aware of it, by the coming of this man who was really a skeptic, not religious, not a Christian, but used of God to come at this particular time, and even he was not aware of the part that he was playing in the fulfillment of prophecy and of God's beginning the work to restore the land back to Israel. He was hearing and he was showing mercy. Now, you know, a coincidence can be random and one can accept that that's just a coincidence. But with all these events coming together, there are so many that it couldn't possibly be a coincidence. It must be the plan of God and the hand of God in the affairs of mankind, his faithfulness towards Israel. So let me say in conclusion that these events that seem to be historically very insignificant actually are very important in the plan and purpose of God. And we need to be aware that God is moving behind the scenes, but he's definitely honoring his word. His word is reliable. His promises are sure. God is faithful and true to the covenants and the promises that he has made. What he has said, he will do. It's very similar when one thinks of the way God works to a little Jewish baby boy being born and placed in an animal eating trough in Bethlehem. So insignificant, but it turns out that he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the ruler of the universe. So that's how God works and we need to be aware of the way in which he works and put our absolute trust and confidence in the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, and his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.